Thank you for joining us this Saturday night for our time of worship and intercession and sharing in God's Word together. Um, this is just our second Saturday night doing a live stream, and so we're excited to have you join us. We're excited for what God's doing and just for the opportunity, not just to seek Him, but to hear from Him and to let Him stir in us. And so I just want to ask you tonight, as you are joining us, please don't just watch. Worship with us. Um, the lyrics to all the songs will be there on the screen for you. Uh, David will be coming in a little while to lead us in intercession. would invite you to join in those prayers, um, to add your prayer requests and your prayers to the comments. And then even as I'm sharing the word later, would love to have you join in and add your comments and just share what God's doing in your heart and what God's doing in your life. We are continuing to prepare for our next step of transition, which we'll be opening to meet in person. That's coming up Saturday, uh, September 12th. So we're only a few weeks from there. But until then, we just pray that we continue to draw near to God, knowing that his promise is that he will draw near to us. So I just want to ask you, please have your Bible near you. We'll be closing worship tonight um, as we have been the last few weeks with uh, a word from Scripture to really set our hearts and to put our eyes firmly on Christ during our time of worship. And so tonight I just want to begin with a word of Scripture from the end of the book of Jude. It's called a doxology, which generally is what we do at the end of worship. It's the last thing. It's what we get sent out with. But I really felt tonight would be appropriate to begin with a doxology, to send us into worship, to send us into intercession, to send us into our time in God's presence together with a reminder of who he is. Jude writes, to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ, our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. 
Father, we thank you today that you are not only the only God, but you've chosen to make yourself our God. We thank you that as we gather here, you gather with us, that whenever two or three come into your presence, you are in our midst. And so tonight, God, we gather knowing we are not only hearing from you, but we are pouring ourselves out to you. And so we just ask to be glorified. Be, be pleased with what happens in our midst. I pray that each and every one of us would remember the nature, the character, the kindness of the God we seek, that we sing of, and that we pray to. And so I pray tonight that you would receive all of the glory and all of the power, that you would receive all of our authority, that you would receive all of our affection and all of our attention. Jesus, you alone are worthy. We give all of ourselves to you. In your perfect and holy name we pray. Amen.
turn to Psalm 46. And as you turn, I'm just going to ask the worship team to, um, to sing that song, to sing We Exalt Thee once more, but to sing the verse before the chorus. You know, we exalt Him is our reaction to who He is. So we can't rightly exalt him if we haven't fully acknowledged him. So I think it's really important that before we close that it's not just an, an action of exaltation, but it is an acknowledgement that thou, O Lord, art high above all the earth. That you are exalted far above all gods. Because we can exalt him and not know who he is. We can exalt Him, but not be announcing and acknowledging His rightful position. So sometimes I think we jump to the action without sitting in the acknowledgement. And so tonight, as beautiful as this has been, before we can really give God His due, we have to not just say what we're going to do, but sing who He is. So in just a minute or two, we'll come back to Psalm 46. But before that, let's just start that song at its beginning, at who God is, and then rightly give him what he deserves. Psalm 46. I'll be reading it from the NIV. Feel free as you are there to read it out loud along with me, to read it out loud with those reading with you, or else just to read it in your heart as you hear me. The sons of Korah wrote, God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea. Though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging, Selah. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her, she will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar, kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice, the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress, Selah. Come and see the works of the Lord, the desolations he has brought on the earth. 
He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Selah. Father, tonight you alone are God. You are the God of all things. You sit in heaven and yet you bow, you bend to be with us. And so God, tonight we just acknowledge your greatness. We acknowledge your beauty, your power, your majesty. We acknowledge that you are worthy, not only of our, pra our praise, but of all praise. We acknowledge that there is nothing that happens on earth that happens without you. You are the one who raises up and who tears down. You exalt and you pull down. You establish nations to use for your glory. And you also remove them also for your glory. And so tonight, God, no matter what's happening in this world, no matter what's happening in this nation, no matter what's happening in this household, no matter what's happening in this heart, we be still because we know that you are God. But stillness is not inactivity, it's the activity of faith. And so we still our worry and we still our fear and we still our own desires and our own intentions for one reason, you will be glorified. And so we just declare your glory and where you are glorified, men are redeemed. And so we don't just ask, we believe that you are being glorified and souls are being shaken and saved, that mountains quake and that things are falling, but you are establishing your kingdom. And so tonight, God, I pray for myself, for my household, for this body, for this community, for everyone that's watching. May we choose to be still and believe that you are God and that you are being exalted and that you will be glorified. Thank you that you are great and you are greatly to be praised. There is no one like you and there is nothing that can defeat you. We trust you. We hope in you. We follow you. Have your way and may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven by whatever means you choose to bring it and establish it. Not our will, but yours be done. Have your way for your glory. In Jesus' perfect name we pray. Amen. Thank you again for, uh, for worshiping with us tonight. It's a privilege to have you here with us. I'm going to ask David to come and lead us in our time of intercession. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, this week, uh, I would say two days ago, uh, we were all informed of the passing of April uh, Umenda, uh, a friend of City of Refuge. Uh, fellowship who served uh, faithfully as a missionary in uh, three different countries, uh, the Philippines, uh, Vietnam, and Thailand. Although uh, I never met her personally, uh, a connection uh, was, was there simply because of our union uh, with Christ and uh, the many opportunities that we had uh, to pray for her in her time of need. The heaviness uh, of her departure was felt by many of us. Uh, uh, but you would agree with me that our feelings of sorrow are nothing compared to um, what's being felt right now by her family and her sisters. April's time and assignment on earth are over. Now she is with the Lord Jesus Christ in his glory. So as we thank God for uh, the life 
April lived, I invite you to pray that God may comfort her family and those uh, she touched who are now in sorrow, uh, as um, many of us are. Secondly, I want us to uh, expand our prayers beyond uh, April's family and to leave the families of many other uh, missionaries who passed away uh, this year. And feel free to expand it even beyond this year. Um, do the reason, again, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking of those family members who uh, see their um, loved ones um, uh, lose life, whether through sickness or through um, uh, attacks, just being on the field. Um, one of the questions that came up was this here. Do they glorify God because of the lives their uh, loved ones uh, lived, or do they think that the commitment and the devotion of their lo loved ones uh, to the cause of the gospel was simply a waste? That's one of the questions that usually come up, especially for people who dedicate their lives from a young age to serve the Lord in that way. So let's pray for the salvation of uh, those family members, uh, which will be uh, a much greater reward than a simple uh, 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 consolation or comfort, which is pretty much temporary. And lastly, I want us to pray that God, um, the Lord of the harvest, to send out workers like April uh, into uh, his harvest field. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we bless you uh, again for uh, this evening. We bless you for this week. We bless you for two days ago because you knew that day. There was a time that you set for April uh, to join you uh, in your glory. So we lift you up and praise you for all that you have accomplished through her life all that you did in her. Yes, Lord Jesus Christ, you died on the cross so that she could be saved. You died on the cross so that she can have eternal life, that she started while she was on this side, and now she can fully, fully, fully enjoy it. So be glorified for all that you did for her and all that you did through her. Thank you for the years of ministries. Thank you for years of commitment. Thank you for years of devotion that led to the transformation of many lives. Yes, you used her to call out people to you. You used her to transform people, to change people, to break the chains, to bring life. And now, yes, we think of those who are hurting. We think of us within this church who are hurting. We think of those who are even closer, who are closer to her, her sister, her family members. We recommend all of them to you. We think of her co-workers, those who were on the field with her, those who were with her constantly, day in and day out. Those who are even, yes, uh, really hurting right now. So we pray that you can bring comfort in their lives. We pray that you can encourage them. We pray that you can strengthen them. We pray, yes, you can mourn with them right now, that you can walk with them, that you can guide them and help them to see, to see something new. Give them a new conception of what they have been doing for those who were working with her. Give them a new conception, a new... Um, breath a new strength for them to even work harder for them to even uh, push forward because of everything they have seen you accomplish through the life of April and so we recommend again all those family members all the family members who are not of uh, your, 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 your pastor yet we, we, we pray that you can touch their hearts that you can find ways and i trust that that's the uh the the, uh, the desire of every single saint who are there with you that somebody can go and speak 
to their family members to realize how glorious you are. So we pray for those family members who are hurting right now, but we pray so that you can bring salvation to them, so that you can unite them to you, so that you can reconcile them to the Father, so that they can have eternal life in your presence. Lord God, we pray for those who are there who have heard of your calling and who are still hesitant to go into the field. We pray, you know that the harvest is there. Yes. yes, it is plenty, 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 but we need workers and you are the Lord of the harvest. You are also the provider of workers. So we pray that you can touch hearts right now, that you can uh, clarify visions, that you can open eyes for those you want to join in that uh, mission work. We pray that you can touch your hearts and bring them home and bring them to the field so that they can accomplish your work. And in this transition, we pray that you can equip, that you can build them, that you can strengthen them and establish them as true branches to you, the vine. Heavenly Father, for those who are working with her closely before her passing again, I lift them up to you. Yes, Lord, that you can truly comfort them, that they can feel your love, they can feel your presence and know that you are Lord. Know that you are above everything. Know that you are in control and know that you love them. Yes, God. Yes, God. Father, I pray for the workers that are already in the field that you would encourage and strengthen their hearts today. God, you said that you would give them your heart. So I pray that you would let them love the way you love and serve the way you love. And I pray for those who are feeling the weight today of being a laborer and being in the field. God, I just pray that you would give strength that's beyond themselves, that your Holy Spirit would empower them to have everything that they need, God, for life and godliness in you, that they would walk out the fullness of their calling, that they would not be timid, that they would not shrink back, God, but that they would believe and move forward and be saved. God, I just pray that you would make the path clear for those who you have called, as David said, feel the call and, and the stirring, but haven't committed yet. I just pray today for commitment, that you would call hearts today, that you would call minds and spirits today to attention, to hear your voice, to just release them into the field where you call them to be. God, and I pray that whether that's locally or internationally, that you would strengthen and equip, that you would open doors, that you would speak and whisper places to their hearts, God, that would just be preparation for the, the moments that are to come and for the salvation that's to come. And God, we pray for all of these souls that are right under harvest. I pray that you would keep them, God, that you would keep them ready for the harvest, that there would not be one as as Jesus prayed, that not, not one would be lost, but God, you would hold them to yourselves and that you would keep them ready at just the right time that they would know you, God, that they would receive your salvation, that they would walk fully in salvation and know your heart, God, and just being baptized in love and baptized in your identity, Lord, that they would walk fully in the knowledge of you, Jesus. Father, we thank you tonight for April's life. Father, I, your word does not return void. And we know that some plant and some water, but you give the increase. And so we already know, God, that there is a harvest of salvation that has come and is coming from both April's life and from her death. But God, I pray tonight that her life and death would produce a harvest of laborers. Lord, your word tells us that the harvest is already prepared, that it's ready, but that the laborers are few. 
And so, God, we don't pray tonight for hearts to be prepared because that's already done. We pray for laborers to be ready yes. and to be prepared and to be sent out. Laborers in our community and from our community. Laborers in this nation and in every nation. And so even tonight, God, under the sound of our voices, God, I pray that you would begin stirring and turning over hearts and calling men and women and even children to those places of harvest, to those places to be laborers to not just partake of your goodness, but to give your goodness in places that you will set them. And so, God, I pray that April's life would produce salvation, but also more missionaries. I pray that her life would multiply missionaries in multiple nations. And I pray that you do the same thing in each one of our lives. Multiply missionaries to our neighborhoods, to our families, to our country, and far beyond. May we be a people who labor. May we be the laborers that Jesus told us to pray for. And I pray that we would keep praying and keep believing. Father, comfort those who are grieving. And may we let you prepare us to rejoice. Thank you that the death of your saints is precious in your eyes. I pray that you would comfort our hearts until it can be precious in our eyes as well. Thank you for April. Thank you for how she is already with you. I pray that you would continue to work through what she did here in your spirit and by your power. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, David. I'm going to move a little bit of me. Sorry. So again, thank you for joining us. If you'd like, you can turn to John chapter 18. In just a few minutes, uh, a few moments, really, we're going to read um, verses 1 through 11 together. But before we jump into the scripture, um, just announce, as far as announcements go, um, please be sure to watch the weekly update. Um, that gets recorded and updated on Friday and uploaded on Friday. So it is there on our Facebook page. I'm not going to take the time to go through all those things. So it is there. Please be sure to watch it. Um, just reminder-wise, uh, September 12th is our target date to begin gathering again in person. Um, we need help. We need volunteers. The video tells you everything we need. In the next week or two, we're going to be having a Zoom meeting to discuss how we're going to be gathering, what you need to know, and to answer your questions. So again, watch that video and be uh, watching your email for upcoming uh, announcements. This week, the only thing we have on our schedule this week is this Wednesday night is Amanda's birthday. Uh, Amanda, our youth pastor, our tech person, our everything. So this Wednesday is Amanda's birthday, and so we are not going to have Bible study, and instead we are going to give thanks for and celebrate Amanda. So at 5.30 Wednesday night at Kennedy Park, which is in Burlington, on Wood Street, right across the street from Wilbur Watts uh, Intermediate School, um, we're going to have just sort of drive-in, stop, park, say hello, happy birthday party for Amanda. We'll be there from about 5.30 to 6.15. What you need to know is if you want to drive through, you're welcome to do that. If you'd like to park and come say hello, make sure you wear a mask. Um, but that's going to be our time to just celebrate Amanda and to give thanks for her. So that's the only thing on our schedule for this week. Uh, we look forward to a week of rest, um, for a week of preparation, and a week to get ourselves ready for what God's going to do next. The last announcement I'll share is... Coming up in September, we're not just going to be meeting in person again, but we're going to be starting a 21 days of fasting and prayer. All of that information will be coming out through email and in this coming week's video update. So again, please watch Facebook, um, please watch your email, and if you don't have, if you're not on our email list and you'd like to be, just send us a message or right there in the comments, put your email address and we'll get you added to the list. That's all I want to share with you tonight. We'll go ahead and get started with the scripture. Again, John chapter 18. Um, for tonight, we're going to be reading together verses 1 through 11. Um, I am reading from the New King James. John chapter 18, beginning in verse 1. John writes, When Jesus had spoken these words, he went out with his disciples over the brook Kidron, 
where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. And Judas, who had betrayed him, also knew the place, for Jesus often met there with his disciples. Then Judas, having received a detachment of troops and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, came there with lanterns, torches, and weapons. Jesus, therefore, knowing all things that would come upon him, went forward and said to them, Whom are you seeking? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. And Judas, who betrayed him, also stood with them. Now when Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. Then he asked them again, whom are you seeking? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way, that the saying might be fulfilled which he spoke. One of those whom you gave me, of those whom you gave me, I have lost none. Then Simon Peter, having, drawn a, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. So Jesus said to Peter, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my father has given me? There are a few things that John chapter 17 did not tell us that we need to know if we're going to rightly understand everything that happens in John 18. In John 17, we got to hear Jesus' prayers for himself, for his apostles, and for his church. And the way John records that night, it seems as if Jesus walked from those prayers into his arrest, but there was an in-between. There was a space of time and some events that shaped everything that would happen next. I believe that to really and fully understand John 18, we have to look at Matthew 26 and Luke 22 to see what both Jesus and Peter did in between going to Gethsemane and being met by a crowd of soldiers. You know, if I can be honest, the in-between is often the most important part. In all of our lives, it's the in-between where most of the work gets done and where most of the outcomes are determined. Abraham and Sarah became fit to be the father and mother of a great nation in between God's promise and Isaac's birth. Moses was prepared to lead Israel into deliverance in between being raised in Pharaoh's house and meeting God at the burning bush. Joseph was trained for leadership in between his dreams and being appointed a leader by Pharaoh. We could go on and on with biblical examples, but the point is the most important part of our lives is often in between God speaks and when God moves, because that's when God works to prepare or change our hearts for what he's promised, not for what he's promised, but for what he's planned and for what he's purposed. That's when God works not to get things ready, but to get us ready. In Jesus and Peter, we see a contrast of how the in-between was spent. We also see how they, we also see that how we spend the in-betweens will determine how we respond when God's will is finally made clear. As we're sitting here tonight, some of us are in the in-between right now. We believe we are waiting for God, but the truth is God is working in us. We think that he's preparing our promises, but he's preparing our hearts. We think the waiting feels like torture, but the waiting is actually protection. Because if we go into what's next the way we are now, we will be broken by it rather than thriving in it. Tonight, John 18 shows us that if we don't learn to obey in the waiting, we will rebel in the moment. See, there is a war of wills that's being waged. The in-between is where we choose whose will prevails in our hearts. In John 17 and 18, we get to see Jesus chose the Father's will, but Peter chose his own. The question tonight is whose will will we choose? Whose will are we fighting for? Ours or God's? John 18 begins by telling us that after Jesus had prayed that he and the disciples crossed the brook Kidron and went to a garden. Now, according to the timeline that is drawn for us by both Matthew and Luke, this was the Garden of Gethsemane. 
This seems to mean that the prayers that we read about in John 17, what we call the high priestly prayers of Jesus, his prayers for himself, his apostles, and his church, must have happened between the upper room and the Garden of Gethsemane, and they must have been prayed when he was present with all 11 of his remaining apostles. Matthew chapter 26 says that when they came to the garden that Jesus told the group, sit here while I go and pray over there. But then he took Peter, James, and John with him away from the rest of the group and he said to those three men, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Now in biblical language, watch means to pray. When you watch with someone, it means that you stay with them. You join them in what they're in. You don't just sit with them, but you pray with them and you pray for them. You carry the burden with them. And so when Jesus says, watch with me, he's not asking them to stand guard in the physical, but to stand guard in the spiritual, to come alongside him and to carry the burden that he's acknowledging might just be too much for him to carry on his own. You know, we've studied this night for months now, and we've watched Jesus be an absolute rock of obedience to the Father and love for his apostles. But now we get to see Jesus, and we get to see that even for Jesus, obedience and love can take a toll on our hearts and even on our bodies. He showed the apostles the full extent of his love by washing their feet. He called them to love one another the way that he had loved them. He shared that one of them would betray him, and then he sent Judas off to do what he was going to do quickly. Jesus dealt with Peter's arguments, and then he told him that he would deny him three times by the morning. Jesus taught them. He made promises to them. He fielded their questions. He even dealt with their doubts. He prayed for them, and now the weight of that night, but more than that night, it was really the weight of 33 years of wearing flesh, of becoming sin for our sake within just a few short hours. It all began to take a toll on him. And what I think we see here is Jesus showing us that being in God's will is not an easy thing. That being obedient does not take away the weight of suffering. That loving each other doesn't mean we won't ever face sorrow or even ever get weary. You know, we like to say things that sound spiritual. The safest place you can be is in the will of God. Spiritually, yes. But it takes a toll and it weighs on us. And it's hard for us because it's beyond us. Because being in the will of God means that we trust him and we carry his and we carry and we lay our burdens at his feet. What did Jesus say? Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for my burden is 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 light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. What Jesus was saying is, I'll take your load and make things easy. He was saying, we'll carry my load and I will make it, I'll make it possible. I'll make you able. I'll be willing to carry the burden with you, not just for you. Jesus didn't just bear our sin, but he felt his own sorrow. And when he did, he did two specific things. He prayed to his father and he asked for the presence and the comfort and the help of his friends. I believe that we need to learn how to use sorrow in the same way that Jesus did, to use it as a call for help and not a reason to hide. If Jesus' emotions became so heavy that he needed to be surrounded by friends, how much more will we? And yet, isn't our natural response to sorrow to go and hide? Isn't our natural response to sorrow to go inward, to kind of isolate ourselves? We don't just see it in ourselves. We don't just see it in each other. We even see it in Scripture. When when Elijah became overwhelmed with sorrow, when he became overwhelmed with frustration, what did he do? He ran away. He decided, I'm the only one who understands this. I'm the only one who feels this. And when the angel came to him, what did he say? Your journey is too much for you. And so God came alongside him, gave him the strength to go meet with God. And then when Elijah met with God, what was it that God ended up giving Elijah? He gave him several promises and several responsibilities. He told him, go and anoint the next king. He said, go and anoint Elisha to follow you as the prophet. And then he made him this promise. I have 7,000 that have not bowed their knee to Baal. So what was God telling Elijah? You've never been alone. 
But now in Elisha, I'll give you a partner so that you'll know you're never alone. When Elijah wanted to isolate in his sorrow, God pushed him into fellowship. God pushed him into friendship because sorrow is a call to each other, not to ourselves. This is yet another point in our call to be devoted to fellowship. Being like Jesus is to not only share in the sorrow of others, but it's also to share our sorrow with others. It's not to be fine, it's to be honest. If we leave fellowship when our lives are difficult and our emotions are weighty, we are not being like Jesus. We do not find relief in isolation. We find hope, we find healing, and we find strength in fellowship. If you are struggling and you have disconnected from fellowship, you have not found your answer, you have deepened your sorrow. It's not that fellowship takes care of the sorrow, but in fellowship, we find strength for the sorrow. Matthew says that Jesus went a little farther, fell on his face, and he prayed, Oh, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. The weight of Jesus' sorrow was from the cup that the father had given him. Obedience is costly. The plan of God is sometimes painful. The work of God is often, if not always, more than we can bear on our own. See, I'm sure this doesn't sound like good news right now. But we will all have moments, and sometimes much longer than moments, in which God's desire for us feels like it might just destroy us. Think of how many people that God used asked God, not to use them, or at least to please use them in a different way. Abraham asked God to please just give the promise to Ishmael so that he would not have to keep waiting for a son with Sarah. Moses asked God to send someone else so that he didn't have to go back to Egypt and face Pharaoh. Jonah went in the opposite direction of Nineveh. As we will talk about in a few minutes, Peter fought for Jesus' freedom. Uh, for Jesus' freedom. How do you think Hosea felt when Gomer chose prostitution over marriage? Or when Jeremiah felt when he was imprisoned by the king for doing nothing more than speaking the voice and the, and the, and the word of God? How do you think Paul felt when he was arrested, beaten, and even shipwrecked while preaching the gospel? Philippians chapter 119 tells us this. You have not only been called to believe in Jesus, but you have also been called to suffer for him. Obedience is costly, but it is worth it. Obedience is costly, but it is what we are called to. And even more than that, it is what we have been created for. Don't tell, let anyone tell you that if you're being obedient, everything will be as you want it to be. If you're being obedient, it will be as God desires it, but it will often be different than we expected it. See, the comforting part of, for us should be that Jesus was overwhelmed just like we are. But the challenging part is that Jesus didn't just pray for the cup to be taken away. He prayed for God's will to be done. And he showed us that even Jesus had moments when his requests did not match God's plans. And that may be where we divide from God the most. When what we're asking is not what he's been planning. When the way we want his will to be done is not the way he planned to work his will for his glory and even for our good. Do we press into him or do we just keep pleading for him to do what we want him to do? What if all our peace, all our prosperity, all God's promises are found or are waiting for us to pray one simple word? Nevertheless, I think we've done a good job teaching the intimacy of prayer, of pre teaching that God is our father, that he always hears us. We can pour our hearts out to him, that we can ask him anything and should ask him everything. But I'm not as sure that we've done a good job with teaching that the purpose of prayer, the outcome of prayer, that the power of prayer is not that we can move God, but that we surrender to God. 
See, at its most base point, prayer is an acknowledgement of our weakness and a declaration of our dependence upon God. If we could do it, we wouldn't need to pray about it, right? If we understood it all, we wouldn't need to ask him to show us what was going on. If we had the power within us, we wouldn't need to ask for his power to, pers- to, to go- work through us. Prayer is an acknowledgement of our weakness, and it is a declaration of our dependence upon God. So prayer begins with us sharing our need, sharing our desire, and sharing our heart with God. But it does not truly become powerful until we declare our submission to God's will and our trust in His character. The most important word in prayer is nevertheless, because that word lays down our will and prepares our hearts to obey God's will. After Jesus prayed, he went back to Peter, James, and John, and the scripture says that he found them sleeping. Matthew says that Jesus spoke specifically to Peter. So all three of them were asleep, but Peter is the one Jesus spoke to. And he said, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. There's so much in that verse, and we're not going to be able to get through all of it. But let me just start with this part of it tonight. Jesus asked them to pray for him, but he understood that they needed their prayers even more than he did. And so in those moments, he was not angry with them for not praying for him, but he was understanding of what was going to come against them. And so part of Jesus' invitation that they watched with him was that he needed them, but he knew they needed prayer even more. Guys, this place of prayer is not just how God moves, it's how he works in us. And what is he always working? Our protection, our provision, his glory, and our good. If we are prayerless, we are leaving ourselves unprotected. We are leaving ourselves unprovided for. We are leaving ourselves not living in his glory and removing ourselves from what he desires for our good. Prayer, no matter what we're praying for, allows God to intervene, not in our lives, but in our hearts, to change something in us so that he can do what he desires to do in, for, and through us. Jesus' sorrow led him to fellowship and prayer, but what we see here in this passage is Peter's weariness led him to sleep. Even while he was being called to stay with Jesus in prayer, how weary he was ended up winning the battle. What we see is two men with very different responses to very similar emotions. Two men going through something together but made different decisions and how they would go through it. Back in John 18, we see the outcome of each of their decisions. John tells us that the garden was a place that Jesus and the disciples went to often. This is an important point because it tells us that Jesus did not allow the circumstances of his betrayal and his arrest and his impending death to change his decisions. Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him and he didn't go and hide. He stayed true to who he was and he stayed true to the way he was called to live. All of our circumstances have changed in the last six months, haven't they? I've had conversations just today with people where we've talked about how nothing is the same as it used to be. How so many things have been changed. So many things have been removed. So many things seem out of reach for us. We have places we can't go. People we can't see. Comforts we can't see. But we are never allowed to allow a change of circumstances to cause a change in our character, our identity, or our mission. In Philippians chapter 1, Paul was writing to his friends that were upset and disappointed that he had been arrested. You can almost hear them. It's not fair. Their accusations aren't even true. You should not be in this position. You can almost feel how they want to battle against the religious leaders, how they want to go and petition to Caesar and petition to Rome because you are not where you should be. They could not see how this could be God's will, how this could be a good thing, or how God could be in it, or how God could ever use it. But Paul wrote back to them in all of their worry, in all of their frustration, in all of their anger, in all of their emotion. He wrote these words, but I want you to know that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. 
Paul writes to his friends that his arrest, his unfair treatment, his circumstances have turned out to be tools that God used to spread the gospel even farther than it would have spread if he had been where he wanted to be and if he was doing what he had expected to do. Imagine that. Paul the apostle, Paul the missionary, Paul the teacher writes from his house arrest. It turns out that what is happening to me is furthering the gospel further than had I been pre- Preaching, that had I been traveling, that had I been journeying, that I am exactly where God wants me for exactly what God wants to do. Paul was writing, I'm where God wants me to be, to use language that we've been using during this pandemic. Paul was saying, this is not happening to us, it's happening for us. Paul did not allow being in prison to keep him from being who he was or doing what he was called to do. And so you can imagine it because he tells us exactly what happened. He preached to the guards. He preached to the staff. He preached because he was a preacher and being arrested would not cause him to stop preaching. So can I ask you a pointed question tonight? Have we continued being who we are? Have we continued doing what we're called to do during our change in circumstances? If we haven't, let's be convicted. Let's repent and get back to who we know we are called to be. Even in a pandemic, even in turmoil, even in unrest, even in division, we must be who we are called to be. We must live for Jesus by living like Jesus. We cannot allow our circumstances to change our character. But it's not just these present corporate circumstances. Some of you are going through your own personal circumstances. Some of you have been going through personal circumstances for a long period of time. Maybe it's your marriage or your job. Maybe it's your finances or your health. Maybe it's frustration and disappointment, anger or fear or anxiety. My question for you tonight is, since you entered into these places, are you being faithful to the character of God or are you reacting to the circumstances? Are you reacting to the emotions that the circumstances have raised? There are times when our lives change, but our character cannot change. There are times when our opportunities are limited, but our calling and our identity must remain the same. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 58 tells us that because of the the victory that Jesus won in his resurrection, that we must now stand firm and let nothing move you. Always give yourselves to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is in vain. Can we go back just a few words and define the work of the Lord? That's not the work that I do, or the work that a missionary does, or the work that someone in ministry does. That's the work of being the body of Christ. It's the work of devoting ourselves to prayer, and devoting ourselves to worship, and devoting ourselves to fellowship, and devoting ourselves to the Word of God. And so I'm going to continue being pointed. The circumstances that you're facing, the circumstances that you have been immersed in, some of you listen for years, you've been immersed in circumstances, have they changed? Change how you how you abide in Christ, but also how you choose to do the work of the Lord. Have they interrupted the way that you're called to be a husband or a wife, a mother or a father, a co-worker, an employee or even an employer? Have they changed the way that you love your neighbor, that you live quietly as citizens of heaven? Have they changed us? Because if our circumstances have changed us, we have missed what God was doing for us. And what God desires to do through us. We must remain steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. And sometimes it's not just what happens to us, it's what doesn't happen to us. Some of us are waiting for things that we think that we can apply ourselves to when they get here. If you don't stay faithful in the in-between, you will never get to the purpose that you were called to. There is a point that even things that we are convinced God has promised us, that we have to sit with those things and say, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That's always abounding in the work of the Lord. It's always choosing his will, even when it feels like it just might break up. John says that Judas came to the garden with a detachment of troops and officers 
from the chief priests and Pharisees, carrying lanterns, torches, and weapons. There are a couple of points here that I think are important for, setting, for the setting and the context. There are actually two different groups that came out to arrest Jesus. The detachment of troops is different from the officers from the chief priests and Pharisees. See, what came for Jesus was a group of Roman soldiers and a group of Jewish officers. They teamed up together, the government and the religious authority, the National Guard and the police, if you will. A detachment of Roman troops was between 600 and 1,000 soldiers. Commentators have said that there could have been at least a couple of hundred temple officers. So R.C. Sproul writes that there could have been nearly 1,000 men that came to the garden in the middle of the night to arrest Jesus. I'm not sure about you, but I have never pictured that. I've tried to think back to some of the, the, the videos and the movies that I've seen trying to depict it, and I can't ever think of one scene that was literally a thousand army and police coming for one man that happened to be with 11 friends. I've always pictured, pictured Jesus with his 11 disciples and a group of soldiers probably similar in size, but according to the way the word is written, that's not at all the case. An army was sent for Jesus. They were sent to intimidate him. They were sent to make him look small. They were sent to make others think that he was powerless. And they were sent not just to arrest him, but to try to crush the spirits of those who believed in him. They were also sent in that manner because they expected a fight. Because they thought they were in control. See, they didn't know Jesus because they didn't understand God's character. They thought this was their plan. They didn't know that they were actually in the middle of God's plan. This, for me, is when the story really becomes amazing. And sometimes, actually most of the time, I have just read through John 17 and 18 and not really paid attention to a lot of the details, but the details are absolutely mind-blowing. This crowd of nearly a thousand soldiers and officers carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons approaches, and rather than them coming to Jesus, John says Jesus, knowing all things that was going to happen to him, that he went forward to them. So what that means is, as this crowd of soldiers thinks they're coming to arrest him, he goes out to meet them. He flips the authority and allows them to understand, you think you're coming for me, but I'm coming to you. John says that when he went forward to them, he said to them, whom are you seeking? So rather than them being able to come and use their power and use their strength and bring their intimidation and say, where's Jesus? Jesus goes to them and says, who do you want? Whom are you seeking? Jesus' prayer time had taken him from sorrowful to confident. Does that look or sound like the man that just minutes, maybe hours earlier, had fallen on his face and prayed, overwhelmed by sorrow, even for the, to the point of death, that God would take his cup, this cup from him? He was no longer hoping for the cup to pass. He was sure that his father was present. His time in the garden had strengthened him in his weakness. It had encouraged his discouragement. It had filled his heart with hope. He was no longer exhausted with sorrow. He was strong and strengthened with faith. Not just because he had prayed, but because he surrendered. Some of us have spent so much time praying for what we want and never surrendered to what God wills that we're still exhausted that we're still worn out, that we just keep praying the same thing and the same thing and it not happening is taking our strength rather than giving us strength. What Jesus shows us is it's not about praying for what you desire, it's about submitting to what he wills. And the strength and the courage and the faith and the joy that comes, it comes when we surrender, not when we plead. So always ask, but make sure you submit. The important part of prayer is the submission. Bring all your needs. Bring all your petitions. Ask for your daily bread. But in the end of it all, make sure that you have submitted. Not my will, but yours be done. Because that's when courage comes. Some of you, I've been praying with you for things for years. Please, 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 let's not just pray for the thing we understand. Let's pray for the will of God to be accomplished. We are allowed to ask him, God, build that building. God, heal that body. God, bring that spouse. God, change that situation. God, accomplish your per. But God, change the thing I don't understand. But what we have to pray at the end of it all is accomplish your will. 
because I only see in part, and I don't know as much as I think that I know. And so I need you to change me. When Jesus asked, whom are you seeking? The crowd answered, Jesus of Nazareth. To which he responded in the New King James that I just read you tonight, I am he. But the Greek here is extremely important. It is two words that don't generally go together. It's ego and emi, and it literally means I am, I am. Hmm. It's the Greek equivalent to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, when Moses asked who he should tell the Israelites had sent him, and God said, you tell them, I am who I am has sent you. Jesus was not just saying, that's me. He was declaring, I am God. I am, I am. How do we know that Jesus was making a divine declaration and not just identifying himself to the crowd? Just look at John 18 with me and look at the response. Now, when he said to them, I am he, or I am, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. A, so a thousand soldiers, a thousand police officers, a thousand men with weapons and lanterns and torches. When they drew near to him and he said, I am, I am, they were pushed back by the sound of his voice. They were knocked down by the reality and the revelation of his identity. They had no power over him. They thought they had come under the orders of their leaders, but they had come under the authority of God. Jesus said his name and they all fell down. This was not happening to Jesus. He was doing this for us. They were laying on the ground and he asks them again, whom are you seeking? This is almost comical if we're picturing it, if we'll see it the way that John actually wrote it. Because a thousand men were suddenly being controlled by the voice of one man that bore no weapons other than his own power and his own character. Jesus took control of the situation. The army was now at his mercy. He was not at theirs. This was not Rome's will. It was not the Pharisees' will. It was not even Judas's will. It was God's will. And Jesus was content and even joyful in it. His power is astounding when we allow ourselves to see it for what it is. After Jesus was asked a second time, whom the crowd, after Jesus asked the second time whom the crowd was seeking, they answered again, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I have told you that I am he. Therefore, if you seek me, let these go their way. How amazing is it that while Jesus was being arrested, he was protecting his disciples. That even as he was being led to the slaughter like a lamb, he was still being their shepherd. He stayed not only in his character, he stayed in their relationship. He did not become so consumed with his circumstances that he neglected their relationship. See, this reminds me of the character of the father in Luke chapter 15. That the reason that Jesus told that story, because the father stayed in his fatherhood even when the son disowned him. See, we don't get to change character. Hosea stayed a husband. Esther stayed a Jew. Paul stayed a preacher. And Jesus stayed their master. He stayed the lover of their souls even when everything was closing in on him. Some of us can't be who we are unless things are exactly the way they're meant to be, which means we've never prayed nevertheless. It means our heart still believes that things are supposed to be ordered for us rather than us follow the order that's been given to us. And I encourage you tonight, if something you struggle with is being able to do the will of God when you're struggling with your own desires, being able to stay in character even when things are different than you want them to be, then you need to go back to the nevertheless. You need to understand that your heart still believes believes God's will is supposed to fulfill your desires rather than your life accomplish God's will. And so Jesus, in the most difficult moment, the moment he sweat drops of blood trying to avoid, when that moment finally came, he put his attention on his disciples rather than on himself. He didn't make it all about him. He continued to follow his father, but he also continued to serve those that he loved. I don't want to repeat everything that I shared earlier, but I think we must be devoted to fellowship because it's our calling, it's our identity, but it's also God's character. 
We have not been given the freedom to splinter when we are under pressure, to isolate when we are overwhelmed, to scatter when we are uncomfortable, disappointed, or discouraged. We don't even get to divide when we have been wronged. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church when he heard that they were going to court and suing one another. He said, why wouldn't you just choose to be taken advantage of? When's the last time that we preach that in our culture? That within the body of Christ, that if you get harmed, your first calling is to forgive. Not to get what you deserve. Mm -hmm. Not to declare your rights. Mm -hmm. But to ask for God's will. Nevertheless. What if we need to begin praying nevertheless, not only in our relationship with God, but in our relationships with each other? Father, I want this relationship to be pure. Nevertheless, not your will, but yours. But yours being, I want what I deserve. I want them to apologize. I want them to recognize they're wrong. I want them to go back and tell the truth for the lies that they've told about me. I want my reputation restored. I want the truth to come out. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. What if we don't need everyone to know that we were right? What if the one who wronged us needs to know? That our hearts do not hold it against them. So that they can, they can believe that God's heart is willing to forgive them. Our circumstances can't change our character. While Jesus was being arrested, he protected the men that were about to desert him. And the one man who was going to deny him. Again, our circumstances can't change our character, but they also can't change our relationships. We must hold true to who we are and to who we've been joined to. If we don't live in fellowship, we aren't living like Jesus. Now, as a very brief aside, because I don't want any of you to think what I'm saying is that we just have to grin and bear it. We just have to endure it. We have to listen to the voice of God in it. Jesus allowed Judas to splinter and go his own way and go and betray him. Paul split from Barnabas, and I don't believe they were supposed to. Just to give you my own interpretation and understanding of the scripture, but God gave grace in the middle of it. Mark, John, Mark left and they allowed him, but he came back once God had worked in him. It doesn't mean you are to take abuse. It means that we have to let God lead and we have to keep our hearts open. And we have to make room for restoration and reconciliation because that's the true story of redemption. It's not just when we're made right with God. It's when we can live rightly with one another. Verse 10 then takes our attention from Jesus to Peter. It says, then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Now, don't make this about the sword because Jesus told them to bring swords. He asked them how many we need bring a sword. And they said, we have two. He said, that's plenty. I don't know why. I don't fully understand it. But they weren't wrong to have the swords. But here's where I believe all of this starts to come together for us. While Jesus was submitting himself to the father's will, Peter was fighting for his own will. While Jesus was confident in God, Peter was afraid of for himself. Jesus saw what God was doing, but Peter could only see what was happening. I have to repeat that. Jesus saw what God was doing, but Peter could only see what was happening. In our lives right now, can you see what God's doing, or are you focused on what's happening? Can you see the hand of God or can you only see the difficulty of the circumstance? It's the difference between Jesus's reaction and Peter's when pressure finally came. Peter followed his heart instead of following Jesus's example. And haven't we all done the same thing? Haven't we been so pressed by the moment that we've acted out rather than holding firm? Here's the problem that Peter had and that we have more often than we'd like to admit. Peter wasn't fighting against the Romans or against the Jews. In that moment, Peter was fighting against God. See, the difference in Jesus and Peter, the difference in Jesus' response and Peter's reaction is found in what they did in the garden and how stubborn they had been with the things that they've heard. See, this was Peter's M.O., right? 
The first time Jesus said, Peter, I, to, to the disciples, I have to suffer. I have to go to Jerusalem. I'll suffer. I'll die. And then what did Peter do? He grabs Jesus. He pulls him away. He rebukes him and says, never, Lord, this will never happen to you. And then even though Jesus rebuked him, even though he heard the father at the Mount of Transfiguration, even though he had just sat with him for an hours and hours of teaching, Peter still wanted his will more than he wanted God's will. He still hoped that if I trust Try hard enough, God will do what I want him to do. And some of us have been trained to pray that way. That if we pray hard enough, God will have to relent. And the reality is, if we pray hard enough, our hearts are supposed to relent. Our will is supposed to be found in his hand. The difference between Peter and Jesus, as I just shared, the difference in their response and Peter's reaction is found in what they did in the garden. See, in between John 17 and John 18, Jesus prayed and Peter slept. Jesus put his sorrow in the Father's hands while Peter let his burden wear him out. Jesus surrendered his will to God. Peter kept his will for himself. Listen to what Jesus said to Peter. He said, put your sword into the sheath. Shall I not drink the cup which my Father has given me? Just a short time earlier, Jesus had been praying, take this cup from me. Now he says, this is my cup to drink. Jesus' prayers didn't change God's will, but they changed his heart. God didn't give him what he asked for, but he gave him what he needed. Peter and Jesus were both in a battle of wills. Jesus laid his down, Peter kept his for himself. By the time the night was over, there was only one of them that was still walking in God's will. We can't have God's will until we surrender ours. We can't live for Jesus unless we live like Jesus. We cannot follow our hearts and fulfill God's plans. I promise you this tonight. Joseph didn't want to be a slave or a prisoner. Daniel didn't want to be exiled from his country. John didn't want to be a prisoner on the island, island of Patmos. But they all wanted God's will. They all trusted God's character. And they surrendered their lives, their will, and their plans to God and for God. Will we give up what we want? Will we accept what we didn't want so that God can have his way? We love to tell these stories in scripture because we have this feeling that they all turn out just the way we think they should have. And the reality is none of them turned out the way people planned them, but they all submitted to what God wanted for them. Joseph never got that time back with his family. Joseph had never got the opportunity to grow up with his brother Benjamin to protect him, to teach him, to love him. He had to spend all that time away from his people so that God could use him later to save his people. Daniel never got to live in Jerusalem, and yet he got to speak for Jerusalem. We can't go through person after person. Job got a new family, but they didn't cease the mourning of his old family. We keep thinking God will do a good thing that will erase the hard thing. That's not how it works. We trust him carry our burden and we believe that his joy may not erase our struggle but it will make our struggle worth everything that we've gone through isn't that what Paul tried to tell us that this light and momentary affliction does not compare to the eternal weight of glory that is being worked out in us for us and through us he doesn't say it stops being an affliction he says the glory outweighs it and so what I want to share with you tonight is the joy of obedience will outweigh the difficulty of the battle. The joy of surrender will outweigh the difficulty of not getting what you wanted or not having it look the way you thought that it should have looked. There is a place where nevertheless becomes the most important word that we can ever pray. The most important word we will ever use in our prayers is nevertheless. Think of this. Jesus went from being sorrowful to the point of death and praying with such intensity that he was literally sweating drops of blood to giving himself up and even taking control of the scene in which he was being arrested. He gave himself up after pleading that God would take the cup from him. Nothing about the night or the plan changed, but everything in him changed when he was willing to say, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Here's my question tonight. Are we willing to pray nevertheless? As we look at our lives, do we want God's will even though it is most probably far different from our will? We can't have both. We can't even have a little of one and the majority of the other. We either lay it all down or we get to pick none of his up. 
Peter wanted Jesus, but he wanted Jesus alive. He wanted Jesus with him. He wanted the relationship they had always had. He wanted Jesus the way he had imagined Jesus, the way he had prayed for Jesus, the way he felt comfortable, safe, and secure with Jesus. What Peter learned is we don't get Jesus on our terms, and we can only have God's will according to God's plan and for God's glory. Tonight, as we close, are we willing to put our hearts in God's hands and then pray, nevertheless? Not my will, but yours be done. Father, end the pandemic. Nevertheless, bridge our divides. Heal our nation. Right our wrongs. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And even our personal points as well. Again, whatever it is you're battling, whatever it is you're struggling, whatever it is you're wanting, you're waiting for, whatever it is that you keep asking for over and over again, make sure that when you ask, you say, but nevertheless, because how can he change your heart if you never give him access to it? How can he show you his will if you keep pleading for yours? What I'll tell you tonight is that God is a healer and he is a restorer and a redeemer. But he does things his way. He does things the eternal way. The way he desires and the way he knows will bring the most glory and do the most good. Are we willing to submit like Jesus or are we still fighting like Peter? Are we allowing God to work in us in the in-between so that he can work through us when the time has come? Don't waste your in-between. Don't harden your heart. Don't give up on God's plans. And don't fight against God. Tell God your honest hope. Tell him your plan. Tell him your desire. Tell him all of your dreams. But then with truth, love, and probably tears, pray the prayer that changes everything. Because it's the prayer that changes us. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Whose will has your heart tonight? Is it God's or is it yours? Don't fight the war of will. Surrender to God and watch him lead you through and build you up for his glory, for your good, most of all for the salvation, for the redemption of the people who are watching the way that you live. We could tell a lot of stories tonight about how it worked and what God did. But here's what it all comes down to. Jesus did not want to drink the cup until he acknowledged that he wanted God's will more than he wanted to avoid his suffering. And in that moment, I don't know if he ever wanted the cup, but in that moment, he took the cup boldly and courageously and he drank it fully. There is something God has for you. But it may be waiting for you to want God's will more than you want yours. Pray whatever it is that your heart desires. But then make your heart pray for only what God wills. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Would you bow your heads with me tonight? Father, I thank you tonight that men always ought to pray and not lose hope. But what we have to pray is for what you want to do. And so I pray tonight for all of my friends that are watching, that are struggling, that are wrestling, that are fighting, I pray that they'd submit. I pray that they'd surrender. I pray that they'd yield. I don't pray that they would give up on their, on their hope. I pray that they would put their hope in your hands and trust your will to be better than anything they've asked or imagined. 
God, I pray tonight for my friends that are struggling, my friends that are weary, my friends that are sorrowful. I pray that they would put their sorrow in your hands, but I pray also that they would return to their places of fellowship. May we learn from Jesus tonight, and may we, when we're overwhelmed, may we run to you, but may we also run to each other. I pray that you would make City of Refuge a people that is defined by not only being sorrowful for each other, but bringing our sorrow to each other. I pray that we would be defined by a people of fellowship, a people who will not break apart, who will not go our own way, who will not let offense or sorrow keep us from the calling to fellowship. And God, if there's anyone watching or listening tonight that has gone their own way, I pray that you bring them back gently and boldly. I pray that you would join our hearts together and that we would understand that there is no way to healing outside of your plan. There is no way to redemption. There is no way to restoration off in isolation. That Elijah's life didn't change until he went back where he belonged. And so I pray tonight that you would put us back where we belong. Unite our hearts to each other. Unite our hearts to you so that you can have your way in us and have your way through us. And finally tonight, God, I pray for each one of us that we would come to you boldly, but we would come to you honestly. And I pray that whatever we pray tonight, that we would be willing to add the nevertheless. I pray that your will would become everything we desire. Jesus, you told your apostles, that the will of God, the will of the one who sent you was your bread. I pray that our sustenance, that our desire, that everything we long for would be found in your plan for our lives. Make us like Jesus and use us to make Jesus known to the world around us. Father, tonight, I give you my heart. And I say, nevertheless, not my will but yours be done. In Jesus' name and by Jesus' example, we pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us tonight. I know that some of the topics tonight have been a little difficult to digest, maybe even a little difficult to hear. If there's something that we can join you in prayer for, if there's a place of fellowship that you've been lacking and you desire, would you please reach out to us? Send us a message. Send us, uh, may leave a comment. Send an email. Make a phone call. But we want to walk with you in this place. It's not just the responsibility of the one in sorrow. It's the responsibility of the body to come alongside each other. And so my encouragement for you tonight is whatever you're battling and wherever you're struggling, God's will is always near. You are not too far away from it, and it will never be too far away from you. And so draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. It's not just his word, it's his promise. It is our desire to hold you up. It's our desire to surround you. It's our desire to be a blessing to you. Thank you so much for joining us. This week, we don't have anything that will be happening here on Facebook. And so we look forward to seeing you back here again um, next Saturday night at 530. Um, for those uh, that, that cannot watch live, everything will be replayed each Sunday on Facebook and on YouTube at 10 a.m. God bless you. We look forward to our time together soon.